Maestro Tanietti, how wonderful to talk to you on this strange medium. Here I am, in seclusion, in isolation in London, in a little corner of my lodgings here, and missing almost for the first time in my life the sound of the surf pounding on the golden sands of Australia. I'm looking forward to the time when I can come back to Australia, do another show, but I don't know whether there's audiences anymore. Mm. What about the Australian Chamber Orchestra? Are you playing to anybody? Are you performing? Well, we did a, a little concert, if you like, a recorded concert, for three people last night, Barry, which is for us a three mass people. a mass gathering in the gallery last night, where we were on um, some of my early shows. Well, we Quite out in success. out in Rooty Hill. Is that correct, Mister Humphreys? Your first? Well, Rooty Hill was my last Australian gig. Oh, we're aware of that. We're still talking about it. And I'd never heard of Rooty Hill. But isn't that where you did your first Sydney? Out of Sydney performance? No, my first out of the city performance was at a place called Granville. Oh, Granville. Oh. They, of course, made it horribly famous by the crash. By a man I met in a pub. The pub was called the Criterion. And that's where the ABC dance bands used to meet. And it was called The Cry. It's still there on the corner of Pitt Street and I think Bathurst. And this man said, would you like to do a show at Granville? Well, I didn't know where Granville was, but he said, uh, you can earn five pounds, which is the equivalent really, I suppose, of $50. So I was very keen to do it. I said, when is this performance? He said, on Sunday night morning every Sunday morning and he said uh, you've got to go to Granville Hill and it's a place it's the RSL now I I'm afraid I had never heard of the RSL because my father was not enough involved in any of the two major conflicts of the 20th century so I uh, went out there by train he said they like blue material he said blue material so I wore a beautiful blue suit that had been made by a Melbourne tailor. I thought if it's made of blue material, they'll, they'll love me there. I didn't understand that blue material means risque mm. stuff, you know, suggestive. And um, which, of course, is my speciality now. But then I had none of that kind of blue material. Well, wh where there. did uh, they had blue movies, didn't they? Sweden, Sweden was quite famous for movies, but I'd never heard of them. Um, I was very protected. I still am, really. I've never really been involved in reality, I'm happy to say. But uh, this hall that I went to, this RSL hall, was full of very fat men in singlets. Singlets were things people used to wear under their shirts. Now, of course, they don't wear singlets at all. You know. and, well, I was a failure at this call. And uh, I got the five pounds given to me very reluctantly. Oh, come on, but tell us a bit more about the, what turned you into a failure. What was the performance like? I mean, well, it must have I been, have it must have been. Do you know anyone who was there? Who, do you still know anyone who was there? No, but I was introduced by another comic. Well, I didn't think of myself as a comic any more than I do now, but um, this fellow's name was Les Foxcroft. <laughs> and he later did a lot of acting and he was in a lot of Australian movies and a very nice man. And uh, he, he, it was he who said they liked the blue material. So... <laughs> Les went on stage and all these men in singlets with huge schooners of beer at 11 a.m. On a um, Sunday morning. 
well, the audience loved him. But I didn't know what to do. So I did an act that I'd done at university where I play a psychiatrist. And I also play his patient, who is a, a person who is severely challenged, I think is the word. Well, the psychiatrist asks him how he is, and then I walk across the stage and I play the patient. And I answer in a very incomprehensible manner, rationally <laughs> manner. And then I walk back and I'm the psychiatrist and I probe. And then I walk back and I play the patient and I again speak in the manner of challenged people severely challenged people and then i become a psychiatrist who is a little slurred in his speech by then and then i play the patient who's getting slightly better and slowly they exchange their problems and in the end the psychiatrist goes crazy and the patient is rational and it takes a long time for this to happen. How long? It takes half an hour. <laughs> and Did you remember the noise emanating from the audience? Were there guffaws, yes, the noise heckling? Was some people rising from their seats and turning their backs on this small stage and going back to machines which had handles. <laughs> the poker, one one armed bandits as they called them one armed bandits and occasionally they coughed up money uh, the audience were very polite in their rejection of me they just got up and left and at the end of it i got the five pounds which was very wet because it had been on a beer soaked bar and the manager of the club was very distant <laughs> and in the train going back to Sydney Les Foxcroft said he said don't worry Barry he said listen there's plenty of other jobs than being a comedian he said uh, if I were you I'd consider that that opportunity he was politely telling me that I was a total failure as a comic well i labored under that uh, burden for some time it returned to me now as my audience is now evaporated uh, i you are a musician i'm told and so you need silence because music is an interruption isn't it of silence sometimes delightful, sometimes repugnant. Comedy requires the audience to make a very loud noise, which is called laughter, applause, and occasionally a standing ovation. These things now belong to my past. I have very, very little to sustain me. I mean, when I heard that this Zoom was going to happen, this is called a Zoom, I was very pleased. I thought I'm going to be on the Alan Jones show. You know, the, the Denise Drysdale program, perhaps, or the John Laws radio concert. But whatever it is, 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 is good for me, very good for my ego but barry if you thought of having little speakers placed strategically around the house and every time you walk past you could tell a little joke and, and coming from the sleeves could be some canned laughter the football is now operating like that with canned I've applause of laughter i've got a cd of laughter and applause and i must confess and i wouldn't say this to anyone else except on this Alan Jones program that I listen to it 
every morning. I play a recording of people laughing and it cheers me up, it launches me into the day. But I want to talk about music because when I went to school in Melbourne a long time ago, before your parents were born and before Alan Jones's aunties were born, and no one much talks about his aunties, do they? No. That's a new field of interest. Um, well, long before his aunties were born, I was in Melbourne and I went to a school, an expensive school from where I learned nothing. But it had a library. And in that library, it had a very good music section. And I loved reading about music. And we had a club called the Gramophone Society, where we played every Thursday recordings of classical or light classical music, sort of thing you do up your street. And because this is Richard Tonetti, who is, as you know, the Andre Rieu of the Southern Hemisphere. And I read about this music in a book called Music Since 1900. I've got a copy of it here. And it told the story of modern music. And every month was chronicled in this book. The concerts of contemporary music in Zurich, in Berlin, all over the place. And I read about composers that no one had ever heard of, who, who were submerged when the fascists came to power and the Second World War engulfed us all. So I've always been interested in, in that music. And in Melbourne, a society was formed called the Society of New Music. And I was a foundation member. And we went along to a little hall in St Kilda every Sunday. And we listened again, sat in an auditorium and listened to the latest recordings from Europe of the operas of Menotti, for example or something new by Stravinsky. I was drawn, generally speaking, to obscure music. I rather liked the idea of composers who'd been forgotten and then we could revive. And with the help of the Australian Chamber Orchestra, this has happened. Mm. It's only begun to happen. I like mostly composers whose names begin with P. <laughs> Generally speaking, composers whose names with, begin with P are um, amongst my favourites. That's Poulenc, mm -hmm. part of Les Fils, yeah. Armgren, who is a. You have to tell. You have to tell my listeners on the Alan Jones show who Palmgren is and how you discovered Palmgren. Palmgren is a Finnish composer of the late 19th, early 20th century. He's really a neo-romantic composer, but astonishingly um, beautiful. Is he up there with your other P famous composer, Fitzner? Up there with Poulenc and also with Pixis. Pixis, Johann Pixis, was a virtuoso pianist of the 19th century, uh, of the Biedermeyer period, and uh, he was a famous pianist. He toured the whole of Europe and even North America. The name Pixis was on pretty well everyone's lips. Another P is somebody who you're very close to, Percy Granger. Percy Granger and Marcel Poot. Uh, Marcel Poot, now, yes. I have Marcel to thank Poot. Maestro Tonietti for indulging me mm. and getting the Australian Chamber Music, Chamber oh, Orchestra, to play the jazz music of, of 1930 mm. by Marcel Poot. A lot of people have said, Barry, that one of their favourite things is the Weimar exploration. 
So why, why don't we just talk a little bit, bit about that? It, it's extraordinary. But just before we do, Al, let's think about the future rather than just um, only focusing on the past. When are we going to put on our, sponsored by a German bank, our exploration of French music? Because you mentioned Poulenc. Is Poulenc really one of your favourite composers? Uh, yes, he is absolutely one of my favourite composers. And and any other composers from those Les Six that you enjoy or adore? Yes, I do adore. Who who comes a close second? Um, Mio, perhaps. No, I love Mio. I love those French composers. I like the music of Schrecker, Franz Schrecker who was in 1920, perhaps, perhaps the most famous composer of opera in Germany, certainly. Uh, and uh, Franz Schrecker disappeared without trace. He was interrogated by the Nazis in 1933 and died almost immediately afterwards. He was a great teacher. He taught many composers and he wrote famous operas, generally of a very rather erotic, I say that apologetically. Blue operas. Slightly. Yes, blue material in, was in fact integral to his work. Um, his operas are, I don't know if I can say this on, on a family program of this kind, but they were arousing. They were definitely arousing. As arousing as Sonata Erotica. And what an extraordinary piece. Sonata yeah. Erotica. Now, I might point out to our listeners that, or our viewers and listeners, that a lot of this obscure, neglected, suppressed music was enjoyed again by large audiences, thanks to the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Together, Maestro Tonietti and I conceived a program of this music, which would have great popular appeal, uh, but would also ex excavate forgotten reputa musical reputations. And we did it in Sydney, in Melbourne, all over Australia. We performed it in Europe, in, at the Edinburgh Festival, in London, Kedak and Hall Centre, and even in a very famous old folks' home. <laughs> Outside of Pittsfield. United States. It was a and it was 40 degrees. 45 degrees Celsius. You remember that night? It was it so gave that old audience a horrible. new lease of life. Many of the members of that audience lived another week <laughs> after we had performed there. And I think that's an achievement, don't you? Correct me if I'm wrong with the, the dates here, but the uh, Dobell, the Dobell Archibald, um, Dobell Archibald of, of Ollie, Margaret Ollie. Uh, Margaret Ollie. It was 1948, was it? And then... Yes, Margaret Ollie was not a composer. <laughs> the... but she loved music. She always had the radio she on. Loved music. I don't think she knew much about it at all, but she had a visceral. Nothing what, about music. She had what which we is call the best a visceral. Way to love it. Yeah. But she always had the radio on it. Unless she... you enjoy things. But tell me, do you know much about the art or artist? I've never said his name, so excuse me if I'm saying it in the wrong way. Arthur Merck or Merch? Merch. Merch. I personally knew Arthur Merch, who was a pupil of George Lambert mm. and a very small man. So he won the Archibald the year he before. Avalon. Avalon is a suburb, a seaside suburb of Sydney. And Arthur lived out there in Avalon and painted very beautiful pictures, mm. which you can still buy for nothing. 
nothing. And he's one of my favorite artists, and I've got a beautiful nude painting of his, which is a little blue mm. in places. No, but he also went to Central Australia, didn't he? It's only blue in about one place. Because the sea is in the background there. But Arthur Murch has got very little to do with music. I never, I heard him whistle once, that's about it. It was due to an ill-fitting denture. A, um, a very musical artist or somebody who listens to music, listens to music a lot is Bill Robinson. He does a yes. brilliant triptych. Does he? Uh, All I do know though, that the photographer, Bill Henson, is a great, not just a lover of music, but a man of profound, with a profound knowledge of music. Bill Henson is a photographer, a famous photographer internationally, who has been described by a former Prime Minister of Australia as revolting. Absolutely revolting. Which gives you an idea of how great he is. Actually, Barry, I, I, I think that the, that former Prime Minister of Australia, those two words that he used to describe Bill Henson's art are the only two words he used to describe any kind of art during his Prime Ministership. <laughs> I want to un answer an e earlier question, Maestro, and that is, uh, might we not do a program of neglected French music. Yes, exactly. As you said, sponsored by a German bank because we had a French bank sponsoring Weimar. <laughs> yes, we did. A German bank sponsoring. <laughs> we could include the music of quite a few people who collaborated with the Germans during the occupation, <laughs> whose reputations were later trashed by Boulez, who was sort of fascist in his in own way. But there's a lot of neglected French music because there's a lot of French music. And so obviously it's not, you know, it's not very well known. I have in my music library, the sheet music of some of these composers. Well, may this interview be a catalyst for you to start collating a list of works that we can investigate, Barry, and we can start putting together a show. And when you, when that you would add a list, wouldn't it? And when you a get on list of music, when you get on yeah. that boat, to other to, nations, couldn't we? Barry, is that how you first made it to to Europe yes, across I the came lake? To England on a boat, an Italian boat, which didn't go to England. It went to Venice. Mm from Men Melbourne to Venice. And that was the experience of a lifetime. It's left an indelible mark on me. And I love the music of Venice. You know, I love, uh, even though his name doesn't begin with P, I love the music of um, Galuppi. Viv Vivaldi, so long well, as it's not- There are horses. two P's in there. Galuppi. Yes, it's got two P's in it. Galuppi, you see, yes. P is hidden, <laughs> is encrypted in the name of Galuppi. I like per Pergolese mm. very much. And... Um, do you like opera, Barry? Do you like Puccini? Another P? Yes, I do love the operas of Puccini. Um, the Rake's Progress. Yes. Well, the Rake's Progress of Stravinsky, hmm. actually not my favorite work by Stravinsky, I'm afraid. But I do like the operas of Benjamin Britten, particularly Death in Venice. But did you know W.H. Auden, Barry? Hmm? Did you know him? W.H. Auden, who wrote the Rake's Progress? I knew Auden who did it, but uh, not terribly well, but I did know him. Uh, he wasn't a friend of mine. He was a close friend of my father-in-law. But, um, and I think, funnily enough, and this is a, brings us back to the beginning of our conversation, 
I think one of Alan Jones' aunts knew him. (laughs) (laughs) She often used to quote Auden. And uh, I don't even know if Alan knew that. Uh, She's a delightful woman. Hester was her name. (laughs) Britain came to Australia. Benjamin Britain visited Australia. And the opera house was in construction the Sydney Opera House. And uh, he was being shown over the Opera House by a bureaucrat. And uh, the bureaucrat said, oh, look, uh, we've got this orchestra pit now and we can put the orchestra in there. It's it's quite a good idea, don't you think? And Britain said, well, yes, it is. He said, it's a big orchestra pit. He said, you could put the whole orchestra in there. And Britain looked at this minute. Minute. You know, they're in the process of redoing it. Patrick Patrick White was somewhat disappointed that the collaboration was thwarted between the two of them. Patrick Does that White, ring a bell? When our great writer, Patrick White, met Benjamin Britten at the instigation of Sidney Nolan, hmm. they were going to do a production of Voss. Patrick's White's novel, totally unsuitable to, to operatic treatment, though someone did attempt it, I think. Mm-hmm. Richard Meal, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, but Patrick didn't get on at all no. with Benjamin. No. They didn't like each other. In, at, you can imagine it. They both had some, something in common. But God knows what it was. Do you have a favourite opera, Barry? Something that you listen to? Yes. Oh, go on. My favourite opera is Rosenkavalier. Hmm. Interesting. By Strauss. It's the great of the only opera in which I actually cry. Every time, you know, in that third act when they is it when they that beautiful music actually these dry unemotional orbs occasionally leak now barry a little different to opera can we talk about blossom deary a bit Hmm? blossom deary oh i love Blossom. because you knew blossom deary barry a little well i knew her all my Blossom Deary CDs are signed by her. And I used to go to a little club in New York and she would play. And at the end of her career, she often forgot the words. And the audience knew them so well that they would, she would say, she'd keep on playing. And what a beautiful player, Barry. Incredible yeah, pianist. Played. And, and she'd say, I can't remember those words. Someone would yell them out to her blossom. And, she just go on. and so she wonderful person on the stage, yeah. a lovely girl, wonderful girl. Uh, when I have my memorial service, which is probably going to be about the middle of next year, uh, I'm going to be there, of course, because well, I was going to say you want it whilst you're still around. Okay, <laughs> of course I will. But I want to be present at my memorial service because I want to see how many people cry. And um, I've got a friend who's going to sing a Blossom Deary song. Her name is Satu Vanska. Now, she's a descendant. She's the illegitimate granddaughter of Palmgren. Barry, you weren't meant to reveal that. Finnish composer. And she, in spite of a very grave unfamiliarity with English, English language, she and probably won't understand what the words mean, she's going to sing a beautiful song. Richard, you should meet this girl. She is adorable. She's simple simple you know can't speak english she's not, 
English not, very not slow. In intellectual here, we're not talking Mensa. But <laughs> got a lovely nature. We could go on enlightening our public forever. There would be people hanging on every word, and when we stop talking, they're going to fall into an abyss. <laughs> but all things do come to an end, and unfortunately, your the old enemy on my wrist is hunger. You're hungry, Barry. We know it's lunchtime. Just be honest about it. I'm where I am, <laughs> and it must be getting late into the Actually, I can smell a cake wafting through my computer, Barry. Someone baking a cake for you in the background? But listen, I'm hoping when I am quarantined at the Wombat Motor Inn, Granville, <laughs> one star, having got off a plane from London, I hope you can squeeze a cake under the door. We will. We will, with a file in it so you can escape. And Barry, collate your program. What program? The French program. Oh. We'll, we'll find the German bank and onwards and upwards. Listen, I'd okay, Barry. love to see you. It's we love so you. good to see you, Barry, too. So nice to see yeah. you. Bye-bye, Barry. Bye-bye, darling. <laughs>